Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this session on digital government and open government for smart cities. I hope you're all awake. Can I have a show of hands? Who's not awake? All right. That's the last session. We're going to try to make it fun and interactive. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Samia Malham. I'm a digital government specialist at the World Bank. I'm very happy to be here with you in Barcelona. And I'm here to moderate this session, which will put linkages between what's going on at the local city level government and what's going on at the central government level. So it's a complex issue, as you all know. And before I start my very brief intro, can I have a show of hand who works for a local government or central government here? OK, thank you for being with us. Uh, who works for private sector? Private sector, very good. Um, civil society organization or academia, NGOs. OK, I'd say we're a pretty good mix, a third of each. So I, I hope that we can get a lot of feedback and questions from you. As, as you know, there is the Ask Vote application that you have you, through your Smart City Expo mobile app. So please ask us questions through that. The way this panel is organized, we have two sections. Uh, the first one is 50 minutes. We're already into it. There will be a networking coffee break. And then the second session will start after the 15 minutes break. And we'll try to wrap up and have you all uh, back home or at a party by 5.15. So what I wanted to share with you is a bit what the World Bank is doing uh, in the space of digital government at both central and local government level. Uh, again, a show of hand, were any of you at the Smart City Lab morning session with Belgrade? Yes? Thank you. Um, so through that lab, we have kind of brainstormed with the mayor of Belgrade on the ecosystem needed for smart city transformation, both digital but also the human aspect, which we found were the most difficult to uh, undertake. So the World Bank has been working on technology for many years now. We see it as really uh, indispensable to accelerate and amplify the impact of any development effort. Long seen as a luxury tool, uh, ICTs have now been part of every sector reform that we are working on, ourselves, our government clients, and our partners, many of you in this room here. So technologies is now everywhere, internet of things, internet of people, internet of cities in this context, cloud, a big help for government so that all the data is consolidated and securely stored in data centers, applications for smart transport, smart health, road safety, agrotech, green growth, we all know this. The challenge is how do you mainstream it in the way we plan and design projects, the traditional way donor organizations do that, and how do we do it with the participations of the beneficiaries, society at large, citizens, businesses, etc. It's not an easy change, it's not an easy shift, it requires a lot of interactions, face-to-face, -face, big meetings, a lot of awareness, advocacy, even preaching in some cases, and we are trying to have as big as possible an ecosystem of partners and knowledge partners specifically to amplify these messages. What I work on is typically digital government and I deal with central government. And central governments already have enough challenges. Imagine the same challenges at state government level and then local city level. It's that picture that you see in a 3D cube sliced into central, state, local. So when you're creating or when you're upgrading an information system, try not to do it in silos, which is not very effective, which is very costly, but try to do it using a base of shared digital infrastructure and shared services. And we have here, like, if you will, not the ideal, but as good as it gets approach to digital government, starting with the foundations that need to be shared, broadband infrastructure, security, authentication, and then the shared services. On, and on top of these, the specific sectors build their own applications. So digital health, digital learning, uh, taxes, customs, etc. 
what we find very often is our clients do not apply that shared model. Everybody starts his own thing. That's fine. Sometimes it's more efficient, but then these systems are not connected together. And we spend an enormous amount of time either re-entering data or buying totally new systems, and that creates a sort of cynicism around technology in public sector. Luckily today, technology is such it's much more agile. We have grown a lot in our knowledge of interoperability. We have a lot of open standards, international standards, and what we go around advocating for our clients, whether they're from central or local government, is to build application where the data can be sustained, can be curated, can be shared, even as the application is phased out and replaced by another. So we have with us two excellent keynote speakers. I'm very proud and honored to introduce them. We're going to start with the case of Brazil, the participatory model of state of Parana. We have with us a two times mayor and an adventurer uh, who joined Jacques Cousteau, um, uh, Mayor Barros. Uh, he's the state, state secretary for urban development, Silvio Barros. I'd like to welcome him to the stage. Silvio, please introduce yourself and let us know what you're doing for the state of Parana. Well, thank you very much for uh, this opportunity of sharing some of our experiences. It's wonderful to be here at the Smart City Conference. Thank you, Samia, for the guidance in discussing with you a few aspects of uh, what we are, uh, we would like to say about What's important in terms of long plan, uh, long planning, long term planning, and uh, uh, smart cities concepts. First thing I would like to say is that I want to change this slide as soon as we finish for the next uh, speech in, in, in the future, because participatory uh, governance means that people have participated. But collaborative governance means that they have participated and collaborated with the process, which I think it's exactly what we need and what we expect. But first of all, I would like to uh, uh, make an exercise with you here. Let's think about 20 years ahead, 2038. Think about your city, the city where we live, you, you live in. And where is your city heading to in 20 years' time? Do you know? Do you have any idea of how would you like your city to be uh, in 20 years' time? What is your idea? Have you ever spent time thinking about how I would like to see the place where I live in the future? Who is actually planning the future in your city? Do you know that? Who is doing the plans? Or is there anyone planning the future of your city? Your ideas for the future of the community you live in have been considered in the future planning? Do you know if someone has ever uh, give you uh, the opportunity to Share your thoughts. Is the, the plan that is being made, and we hope it is, uh, taking under consideration the mega trends that will come and the smart city concept is for sure a trend? Now, one thing that we have realized is that if you don't know where you're going, you won't get there. That's it. And with cities, it's not a different situation. If our city is not planning where it's going, it, it won't get there. And a lot of people will be frustrated because of that. But Peter Drucker used to say that the best way to predict the future is to create it. So someone has got to be working on this. I'm. I'm going to share with you the experience of the city of Maringá, where I've been the, the mayor for eight years. Uh, is in the state of Paraná, southern part of Brazil. 
400,000 people city, where in 1996, going through all the, the troubles that a, a city normally goes through in, in terms of economics and the financing and, and the infrastructure, the civil society leaders, the, the president of the Chamber of Commerce, the president of the Lawyers Association, the Engineers and Architects Association, uh, Rotary Club, Lions Club, some of the leaders of the community have come to the conclusion that the long-term planning is absolutely necessary if we want to improve the city and make sure that we get better and better uh, as time goes by. Otherwise, depending on who's the mayor, things may go very well and then go down. So the community decided that the long-term planning is a responsibility of the civil society, not the city hall or, or the mayor. Why? Because long-term planning is 20 years. The mayor is there for four years, so we're talking about five different mayors. And we don't know if these guys have ideology uh, uh, differences that will change the plans. Companies and people, they would like to know what's going to happen. So they decided that they were the ones investing on doing the long-term plan, long planning. And every election, before the election, they would call all the candidates and present them the plan and say, would you be willing to sign a document that will register, it's a public document, saying that you will follow our plans for the city, not the whole community will follow your plans for us. And what happened is that for over 20 years, all the candidates that have actually become, become mayors have signed the document and they have followed the plan. The result is that the organized society expresses its wishes to the city government that executes and, um, and implements over time. And the community is monitoring and following up the implementation with the local government. This is the way things have been happening there. And this is the result. Last year, 20 years after this decision was made, based on on indicators, the city of Maringá was considered the most livable, the number one city to live in Brazil. Now, let's understand that this is not a gift from God. It didn't fall from the skies on our laps. It was the consequence of a long-term planning and the participation and the collaboration of the civil society, the organized society, with working together with the local government. And this was actually based on 16 indicators in five different areas, education, public health, infrastructure and sustainability, fiscal management, and public safety. So we're talking about numbers. It's not a question of going to a city that is very beautiful, very green, but we're talking about numbers. So our experience is that it is possible to plan ahead provided that this responsibility is shared or it's under the, civil so the, the organized civil society. Now, the, the SDGs uh, provide us and all the other cities in the, wor in the world the opportunity to exercise some sort of long-term planning because we have goals and targets to achieve until 2030. And this is, of course, pushing cities to think about how they can cooperate, especially because, because the UN has realized that 65% of the targets of the 17 SDGs will not be achieved without the involvement of local governments, with the local community. So if the planet wants to, to achieve those goals, we must get cities involved. And the state of Paraná, in the uh, organization that I work uh, for right now, we have discussed this with all the mayors. We have 399 municipalities in the state, and we have convinced 232 mayors to sign an agreement to commit their administration to the SDGs, which means 
they have been challenged to do long-term planning with the community, because we know uh, without the, the community involvement, this thing is not going to happen. And when we talk about uh, long-term planning, we must consider the concepts, the technologies, the methodologies of smart cities, because these things will happen regardless of, of what the city is doing or uh, the, the aspects of the public administration. Companies will do it. The, the community will require best and most if more efficient services from the government. And in the state of Paraná, we have already started this digital government exercise. Now we have over 350 online public services provided by the state government. And this will go all the way from getting a, uh, a, your, your driver's license to your ID, or uh, if you lose your dog, if you register your dog on the e-government, uh, someone can find it and return it to you, or if, if your bike is stolen. I mean, we're talking about this, an enormous range of services that can be uh, provided to the public. You can pay your electricity bills, your water bills, uh, through the system, because in our state they are public companies. And uh, we are actually providing this platform to the municipalities so that their services, local services, can be plugged in. And through the digital government, we can change the way uh, government and the citizens are relating. And this is also helping us to fight corruption because now transparency is available to everyone. Uh, we can go through this system on your mobile and you can check the stage of each one of the investments the state is doing with public funds in any of the 399 cities uh, within the state of Paraná. So it's, it's actually changing drastically the way the government relates to, to the public. And also, uh, we have established some other mechanisms, and one of them we call the Paraná Interativo, Interactive uh, Paraná. This is a platform that is offered to cities to do urban planning. They can actually use that to identify which streets need, let's say, pavement, and they just select all the streets, and instantly online they get what is the, the amount of investment that is necessary to achieve that uh, target. This is just one example. The in interactive uh, Paraná is an open data. It's open to any person. It's, it's not specifically used by the government. That provides access to an interactive analysis and web map for georeferenced uh, reference uh, data and indicators covering over the 399 municipalities. And it's an instrument for of extensive analytical cap capabilities to help formulate and monitor urban, uh, urban uh, uh, planning and regional development. So these tools and these platforms are now available to uh, cities, to the state government, to the public, and people can actually check if the mayor is taking the right decision in the investments on the investments that they, they are uh, choosing to do. So basically, this is our experience, and I would like to close with a comment on Peter Drucker's uh, quote. Long-range planning does not deal with future decisions, but with the future of the present decisions. Whatever we are deciding to do now, uh, it's going to reflect in the future we expect for our communities. So if you don't know where your city is heading, if you don't know who is planning the future of your city, but if you, if you have plans, then let's find a way to cooperate, to collaborate, to participate, and take responsibility. This is the best way to eliminate the conflict of long-term planning with short 
long-term administrations so that the long-term planning is not affected, is not impacted by political ideologies, political changes in government. So this is our experience. This is what we would like to share with you. We can only say it does work, and the numbers are proving that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Silvio, for showing us the great example of your state and for talking to us also about the long-term the long-term implications and and this is really exemplary exemplary behavior and leadership by doing so thank you for showing that um, I think I'm gonna visit your state soon looks very interesting I'll make sure I don't lose my bike there but if I lose it I know it can be fixed uh, we're gonna travel from Brazil to uh, Rwanda to Kigali actually where our next speaker Didier Nkuriki Mfura, long-time friend of mine and the director of Smart Africa Secretariat, Smart Africa Alliance, will talk to us about the Smart Cities program, but more in general about the Smart Africa program. So please welcome Didier. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. I hope uh, this time all of us are still awake. Um, I'm coming uh, from um, all the way from Rwanda, Kigali. So I came this morning, but I'm very excited to share with you uh, the, what is happening in Africa. Uh, for some of you, I guess, have interacted with different countries in Africa, uh, and a lot of things have been happening recently. So my name, as uh, Samia said, is Didier Nkuriki Mfura. Uh, I'm the Director of Technology and Innovation at the Smart Africa Secretariat. Uh, prior to what I'm currently doing, I used to be the Director General in charge of ICT for the Republic of Rwanda. So for about four years, I was in charge of uh, a lot of plans and implementation of major initiative in Rwanda. So today, I'm just, I just want to share with you a journey the journey that uh, several countries have embarked uh, a few years ago. Uh, some head of state decided to come together and to drive a new initiative called Smart Africa. This initiative is for the first time a commitment of the top leaders to put a focus on technology because they realized that the continent is 54 countries Africa is 1.2 billion people, but traditionally our countries have been defined by their own borders. So they decided to join their forces and to drive this transformation together. So the picture that you see there was in 2013 on 29th of October. Uh, and the people you see in the stage, some of you, you, you might know some of them and may, may, maybe not all of them, but. They were convened by the president of Rwanda, President Kagame, and he invited head of state to come to Kigali and to forge a vision for the continent, for Africa. So those seven presidents, some of them from Eastern, Western, and Central Africa, decided to create this initiative with one vision, to create one market, a single market, single digital market for Africa. Because with technology, this division of these borders don't really matter anymore if they can work together. The regulation that's uh, from a country to another uh, makes very difficult to do business can be actually harmonized. So when you're a business or if you're a citizen, you can move from a country to another and still be able to, to be in business. You can still be able to reach your family, your friend, and you can still grow your business. So, it's, it's a vision of creating a, a, a truly one Africa using technology. So they endorsed uh, a document called the Smart Africa Manifesto. It's a two to three page, it's a three page document that really outlined their vision of creating a single digital market. But what is interesting is it started with seven countries and what you see in this screen is 24 countries. In a span of four years, 24 countries join in total this initiative. 
And as you can see, it's not defined by regional blocks. It's really defined by political will. So that's why you'll see countries in the north of Africa, southern Africa, East Africa, and also West Africa. What brings them together is this passion and this, this drive to do something and to leave a legacy and to create economic opportunities and also job, create jobs for Africa. You'll be surprised, and some of you probably know already, Africa is one of the most youthful continents today in the world. There are countries like Niger, uh, one of our member countries here. When you take the median age of the population is 15 years. I'm not talking about 5-0, I'm talking about 1-5. So there is a pressure also to create something that will be meaningful for the population, create opportunities for them. And technology really uh, offer this opportunity. So currently, Smart Africa is on a span of, uh, of 24 countries, six and over 600 million people. Um, they endorse the manifesto, and those are the principles uh, where they decided each of them at their own countries to put ICT at the center of their socioeconomic development plans to reinforce and to create a strong infrastructure, especially broadband, because broadband is extremely important to deliver all the plans, but also to improve uh, accountability, efficiency, and openness using ICT, using e-government, so that they can better serve the population, but also respond uh, be accountable to the people who have voted them and who have elected them. And also, what I like very much uh, at the point number four is put the private sector first. You might actually wonder why they, are doing, why they decided to have such a statement. It's because traditionally in Africa, several governments, are, are the, the, the government are, are the one taking the lead. And the real transformation, social economic transformation, cannot happen without the private sector. So they say, we're going to go back, and we're going to focus on the environment, creating the right and uh, adequate uh, and, uh, uh, policies and regulation that will allow the private sector to operate efficient, efficiently and also to succeed. And as they grow, the country also uh, we, is going to grow with, with them. So um, currently, uh, those are the leaders who are part of these initiatives. Uh, the president of Rwanda, President Paul Kagame, who has been uh, uh, often referred as a, a digital president, uh, is the current chair for this initiative. And it brings all the head of state that you see twice a year. They come and then convene. They convene to see what is the progress, what has really been achieved. Because they don't want it to be just a political initiative. They want it to see, they want to be able to see the results on the ground on this, in these different countries. But what is interesting is, it's not just a government initiative, it's an initiative that brings a lot of partners, including uh, international organizations such as the World Bank, uh, the African Development Bank, the African Union, the ITU, and many other partners. And not only them, but also the private sector, so we have several companies that have already joined. After actually, uh, we, 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 there, there are three or four more companies that have joined uh, at this stage. And you know some of these companies, and there are some uh, which are less known because it's not just about the big, the big uh, companies. It's really inclusive because we believe that any company, any private sector which has a shared vision with Smart Africa can join. And they are coming because they see the opportunity. In Africa, there's a great opportunity for growth. There's opportunity for investment because uh, there are a lot of, uh, I'll say, green fields. Uh, it's, it's, there are a lot of opportunities today to partner and to deliver uh, this initiative. So a lot of initiatives are already taking place. One of them is the One Africa Network. I know Europe, uh, just last year, you did the Rome Like at Home to allow people from a country in Europe to another country to roam and to still be available, to be accessible. It's also happening in Africa. 13 countries are already part of this initiative. And we're extending it, extending it to all the 24 countries which are part of Smart Africa. Our dream is that an African can move from a country to another and, not be a, not, does it, and without the need to buy a local SIM card still being accessible and call at very affordable rate as when he's calling at home. So it's already happening. 
but there are more initiatives which are coming and which are actually being imp implemented with a focus on data centers, uh, reducing the cost of internet, uh, also developing intra-Africa cross-border uh, connectivity, uh, and also smart cities. And that's one of the reasons why I'm here today. And I'll just come back to it shortly, but investment in education, in cyber security infrastructure, internet for all, and many, many other areas are currently being implemented or considered because some of them are at very, very early stage. Now, what we do is we try to look at the initiatives that have the highest impact because we can't do everything. We can only see the ones that can really create a very big impact in the continent. And what is also interesting in this initiative is that each country, each head of state take a specific topic and lead it at home, but the purpose is actually to share with the rest of the countries, to increase this south south cooperation between African uh, countries, uh, so that we can learn a little bit more from others, because many contexts in Africa are quite the same when you move from a country to another country. Uh, I'll also mention this uh, large event that happened every year now, the second week of May. So if you plan to be in Africa sometime, please make sure you you, you plan your trip to happen in May, the second week of May. That's when you have the Transform Africa Summit. It's the first ICT summit that brings head of state, ministers, uh, and the, the captain of the industry to discuss about the future of Africa, uh, the, the, the digital future of Africa. Now, why is it important? And why we're we we thinking about smart uh, cities as a very important topic is because the same challenges that African, I mean, that um, a lot of countries in, in Europe and in the world are experiencing. The Africa actually experiencing it even in, in, a, in a stronger way. We have challenges with infrastructure, with cars, with water, with energy, uh, and it's only growing. And the reason it's growing is because when you look at urbanization of Africa, in the 1960s, the the, the, the rate of urbanization was about 15%. And when we came around the two 2010, the urbanization rate was about 40%. Now, by 2050, it's projected to become a 60% rate of urbanization. So clearly, you can see that somewhere here around the mid-30s, uh, 2030s, you will have more people living in cities than, living in, uh, than the one living in uh, rural areas. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, it's an important uh, discussion which is taking place in Africa, and a lot of initiatives are already happening. One of them is that the head of state together launched uh, the Smart uh, and Sustainable City Blueprint for Africa. It's a document that's, that really cut... Uh, summarize what is their vision for smart cities for Africa. Of course, uh, countries use them, use it to customize and to localize their own plan for cities because cities are different, countries are different. So Rwanda, for example, has done the Rwanda Smart Cities Plan, uh, which is a five-year plan for the country as far as smart cities is concerned. Tunisia has been doing the same and many other countries in Africa. So if you are private sector in this room and you're interested to partner with Africa, in implementing this important initiative, it's actually your opportunity. Uh, so one of the reasons why I'm here is actually to talk to people who are interested to work in Africa and to, to, to try. We, 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 we don't think twice. Uh, actually, we say that for us, partnership is extremely important because it creates bridges. And it's the reason, actually, uh, why I'm here. So I'd like to call by terminating, by closing this presentation. I'd like to call all of you who are here, who are interested to have a very specific and focused discussion about Africa to, uh, to, have, uh, this, uh, to have this conversation with us. I'd like to thank Samia and of course the organization for this important opportunity to share what is happening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Didier. Let, let me invite uh, Didier and Silvio to please uh, join us for a Q&A. I hope the audience has been uh, taking questions or voting, because we 
do need your interaction. Thank you. Thank you. One more. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're all here, you know, emulating open, sitting out there in the open. So, um, so thank you very much for both of you for your insight. And um, I hope that uh, you use the ask and vote application. And um, hopefully we have a few questions. Yes, very good, very good. So um, we have, um, we have a question, how are the governments facing the digital transformation of their systems? And uh, the second one, which can be related to it, which is which cities are the best example of processing the great quantity of open data? So two, two questions, who would like to, uh, who would like to start? Uh, Didier? Would you? Well, uh, for open data, um, I must say that I don't have the ranking, I know there's a recent uh, ranking that was uh, done for open data, but right. what I can say is that there's been a really uh, strong push uh, from uh, uh, in several governments to actually open the data and to provide more information to the public and because it creates opportunity for transparency and accountability, but also for innovation. So I know a few countries like Kenya, like Rwanda, and like Tunisia and uh, Cote d'Ivoire that have been making a lot of um, progress on that. Mm -hmm. But I must confess that I don't know exactly the ranking specifically for the world. Sure. Uh, but uh, yeah. Sure. So. sure. Well, m my comment would be uh, interesting. The, the platform that I've mentioned, the interactive state, which is the most powerful platform for, for uh, urban planning uh, that helps the cities to do whatever they have to do, and to prioritize their investments. It, this, this platform has been awarded in 2015 as the best platform of its kind. And this year, for three months, I have met with over 300 mayors, and believe me or not, only two have even heard of it. They didn't know it existed. And I'm talking, I did it three months ago, this thing has been operating open to them for three years now, and they didn't even know. Mm -hmm. So our major uh, challenge at this point is to make sure that the, the citizens and the community, the, the beneficiaries of, of all those platforms, understand that they exist, they are available, and they are, uh, and they are challenged to, to use them. Absolutely. So uh, the government is actually doing its homework uh, but the beneficiaries are still far behind. This is in our case in Brazil. Uh, we still have a lot to do in terms of uh, uh, making the people aware of those, those tools and platforms and uh, uh, stimulate them to use them. Mm -hmm. Open data is sometimes scary for governments. And uh, we've been seeing a big movement really um, pushed by the Open Government Partnership by many governments to open up. Brazil was one of the pioneers for the OGP. And one of the mandates is to really open up budget data, open up a lot of the data related to management, services, procurement. And it's sometimes scary for governments. I often a get asked, what do I open up first? And you know, when you look at the examples from Spain, from uh, where we are, from uh, UK, from the US, um, there are lots of services that can be opened first and that are not really dangerous, that help everyone. Like for instance, um, road and traffic information. We're talking about that for smart cities. Weather information. The US made so much money, uh, the private sector, by the weather services opening its data and helping thousands of entrepreneurs start weather-based services using mobile apps or other. So there are lots of areas that governments can open and specifically, maybe if um, Silvio and, uh, and Didier um, give us some hints for a city, for instance, if, if you were, if you had complete control as, as local government, which you did, um, what are the first type of data sets that you find uh, can give a good story and encourage openness uh, by government? The first, the first things you want to open up. Well, um, for instance, we can provide 
services in terms of uh, education. Education. Uh, distance education, we, we can provide that kind of, uh, of uh, improvement and, and, and context. Uh, we can also, one thing that's important that you just mentioned about open uh, data, uh, we have been explaining to the mayors about all, this, all the, these wonderful tools that they can use, and I've been telling them, you know, you'd better use them, because the city councillors in your city will use them. And the people that lost the last election, they will use it to make sure that uh, you're doing the right thing or to blame you for not doing the right thing. But they have access to the same information. So uh, it, it's a little push mm -hmm. to make sure that they, they use whatever it's available. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's a number of, uh, of elements that can be uh, provided and particularly at this point, I think we in, in Brazil and you are all aware of the situation, we should use open data for transparency and for fi to, to fight corruption. Uh, all the information is there. People should look at, they should uh, follow up with, with all the, the public investments. The legislation uh, obliges us as, as administrators to, to put all that information available, to make it available. So uh, I think the community should use it. And this is one of the, the, the first things we should uh, uh, implement and we should open to, to everyone. Uh, thank you, Sami. In fact, I've not had the privilege to be a mayor. Uh, maybe when I grow up, I will also be a mayor. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's an important, uh, it's an important responsibility for, for a country. And uh, coming to your, to your question, um, I think the the, the challenge many cities and many countries have is that it's the, the data is, cl is closed by default. It should be actually open by default, and those ones that really need to be uh, not on the public, only those ones become closed, because either they are confidential or they are uh, information that is not for the public. But in general, data should be open first, open, open by design. So health uh, record, for example, well, not private uh, information about uh, people health, but I'm saying uh, information uh, on, on the sector, the, 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 the some available statistics. Tips. Exactly, tips. Um, you know, take education, there are a lot of information about school, about, uh, again, statistics around schools uh, that could uh, be made available. Uh, and by the way, there's also a way to anon anonymize some of the information so, for example, uh, today, uh, some cities, um, there's been some push, for example, for information around transportation. How many people uh, commute in a sp specific sp uh, place? Um, uh, what are the, the peak points? Uh, and it can also be correlated to, it can help actually better planning or creating tools and solution for, for, for mobility and, and for improving uh, infrastructure where most of the people actually, and you can just anonymize the data by taking the data that is coming from the phone, just anonymize the personal data, but the rest can be put available. Finance and so on, so there are really opportunities, I think, at a larger sense uh, to spur innovation by putting data available. My last question, um, and thanks for those who asked, is how to make all these services for smart cities usable for all. So for the elderly, for the poor, for the very rich, um, how to make them usable, easy to access for all the categories of population. We don't have too much time, but maybe if I can get like a two minute uh, wisdom from both of you, uh, what you have done or what you are doing to make these usable. Maybe we start with you, Silvio. Uh, one of the things that uh, we are improving, and the mayor of Curitiba just spoke about this a few minutes ago, is that uh, we are eliminating all those long lines when people need a medical uh, appointment. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to go to a specific place and wait for hours until uh, they, they have a doctor available. Now this is all online. online. They book their time. Uh, and this is a, an enormous benef uh, benefit for the, for the community. Uh, they can organize their work and then at a specific time not waste a whole morning. Uh, 
uh, they go there and, and, and get their services uh, done. Excellent. Uh, the other thing is that people can follow uh, the, the grades and the attendance of students in public schools on their, their mobile. They can check if their kids have been to school and then how are they uh, behaving and, and what, what is the performance. Uh, because many people work and during the day they cannot go to the school and check these things. And of course this will improve the level of, uh, of education. Absolutely. So there are a number of things that are, uh, I know it's, it's not uh, new for many, many of you, but uh, for Brazil it's quite a These are quite excellent examples and they touch the life of every one of us. Who doesn't get sick? Uh, families and kids, a very good example. Yeah. Maybe a two-minute closing thought from you, Didier. Yes. Uh, so uh, back in Rwanda, I'm, I'm uh, the chair of a, a, it's a it's a company called Rwanda Online Platform. Uh, it's a platform that's as uh, like in Brazil, uh, digitized uh, government to to business and government to citizen services. Currently, about a hundred services are online, from driving license to renew. Uh, permits uh, or, I mean, most of the services, birth certificate, death certificate, all those services that the citizen uh, requests most of the time. What, what I could share here is government used to have several places for services, but what the move that happened through this company, which was given a 25-year build operate transfer uh, contract, was to consolidate all of them into one sing single platform. So instead of having the citizen to remember 10, 20, or 50 websites where to apply for a certain service, it's now one stop shop where you can get all these services. And behind, it's, it's now giving a lot of details, and it can make the government more accountable. If you say that a service is uh, delivered after three days, the, s the record will show that you are really d giving it within three days or you are not actually giving it. So it gives actually good KPIs to improve. But also in Africa, many people don't have smartphones. They have basic phone. So the one of the initiatives we did was to allow them to use very basic USSD to actually be able to, uh, to access some of these services and it's part of the accessibility. That's excellent. That's both of you gave very good examples that everybody can, can relate to. Mm -hmm. And um, we're going to take a short coffee break, 10 minutes. And I would like to ask you to all come back because we have another very good session after this with five excellent speakers. But for now, please help me give a hand to our two excellent speakers. Thank you both very much. Thank Hello again, everyone. Thank you for staying with us. It's probably the content and the good coffee, so we're very pleased to have you again. This is the second half of this session, and it's going to be about urban services with digital technologies. I'm very honored and pleased to introduce the chair of this session. It's Adolfo Barrero. Adolfo is the president of the Smart City Commission of Ametique. He's the CEO of Alto Consulting, and he's been creating several companies, incubators and innovators, such as um, Bolt, the Accelerator, and Cactus 2E. He spent many years working on all the verticals, so he's one of the most qualified people to look at smart cities in an integrated way, transport, energy, water, infrastructure, telecom. So please help me welcome Adolfo. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for the intro introduction, Samia. Uh, good afternoon to, to everyone here in the in a meeting, we are going to have a very interesting session with uh, some very, very fine speakers. And I would like you to pay attention to, to these uh, people because they have different perspective about what is the open data for use for the smart cities. Whereas the, the, the people that may benefit about this uh, open data uh, uh, use in the city the structure of the data, the semantics of the data, and even we, we have a, a person that is quite interesting that is going to mix, uh, mix the concepts of uh, open source plus open data, that is uh, uh, Boris van Hoytma from Amsterdam. He's a truly good expert in, in open source, and he's going to tell us something about the experience in Amsterdam using open data. So please, Boris.
Uh, hello. I hope that you can hear me, probably. I can hear myself, so you can also probably hear me. Um, so my name is Boris Neutma, and uh, as uh, many people in the technology and open source field, I do a couple of things. And I want to be really clear about that, uh, especially also because I see the work that I do also as being a public service and something which has a lot to do with ethics. So it's really important to understand where I'm coming from and what my interests are. Um, all of my work centers around growing an ecosystem of open source cities that are able to do open source. And um, my main vehicle for this is the F Foundation for Public Code that creates baseline infrastructures for cities to collaborate on software. And next to that, I uh, do two things. One is I'm an open source advisor to the city of Amsterdam, which means I help them uh, professionalize their development practices to work together with other cities and to work together with in their own organization in an open way. And I am the open source development manager for an EU consortium, which is called SCORE. And over about these, I will explain a bit more. Uh, I'm also a bit rushed because my presentation c didn't come through. Uh, so at the last moment, I had it to run around to send it in because I sent it in as a PDF, which is an open file format. But apparently, the system only took PowerPoint. And I don't have Microsoft PowerPoint, so sorry for that. Um, so uh, the main point that I want to make, and, and it's maybe also on this, on this panel, is that open is a fundamentally different way of working. Uh, often people think like, oh, we'll just do open data, or we do open source. Or, but as we also heard before, uh, also in the talk of, of Silvio, there's um, do, doing, you can't just like also do open. Like you really, it needs to come from the bottom of your heart, from the guts of your organization, and from the guts of your process to do open. Because working open means giving everyone the chance to look into what you're doing, and also to say what you're doing wrong, or how you could do something better. Now, the drawbacks of open are probably familiar to a lot of you, but I think the biggest advantage of open is that it scales. Because suddenly, you can collaborate with others that are not in the same room as you are. It means that you can um, collaborate with people that you've never thought of collaborating with. And that this really unlocks the ability to work together with both new p partners inside of your organization, as outside of your organization, as in the rest of the world. And so uh, I lead this project in Amsterdam called Amsterdam Open Source. We have uh, quite a large development organization. We have about 50 programmers and, and designers who work on an open data portal. And uh, an open data portal, and also the infrastructures for open data below that. And so what they do is they go into the organization, figure out like where is the data, and then figure out how can we get this data out in the best possible way. Um, and you can't just like put some kind of ready-made solution on top of this, because the organization is very complex. A lot of these issues are not issues about connecting the right systems to each other, but there are often issues about connecting the right people to each other and making sure that the right people have the tools that they need. And for a development organization that works building these open source, uh, open data um, infrastructures, it is really important for us to be very clear about what we do, to be very transparent about what we do, because it allows others to understand what we're doing to them and with them. Um, but also, uh, in addition to that, it happens often that we create something with the intention of having something happen in one place, and then something else happens. For instance, we have in Amsterdam uh, panoramic, like 360 degrees images of the whole city, kind of like Google Street View, but then we've built the software ourselves, we figured out like, how, what cars to drive around and like what cameras to put on top of that car and how they should drive around. And all of this is also open source, so if you want to do the same thing in your city, you can. Uh, and in that, there's a little viewer application. And we built that viewer application for our website because we thought, well, people might want to see what kind of images we have. And then a year later, we found out 
There's another department inside of the city, the public engineering department, that does the road maintenance and that like fixes the, the benches in the parks. They took that element of that viewer from that we built and they put it into their drawing so software. So that if they need to make a drawing somewhere to improve something, they immediately get the most recent image that we have of that place onto their, into their drawing tool. And so we've never, we'd never thought that would happen, but it happened anyways because they could just find it themselves. This is great for within the city, and I think for us the b biggest value in that is, is within the city. But then we also really see the value of this kind of collaboration between cities, because of, uh, as we all know, one municipality or one civic or city organization, one local public administration in one country doesn't do very much difference from another organization. We all have our different languages and our own jargon and our own legal contexts. But if you look at what we really do, we kind of do the same things. And so in SCORE, uh, what we try to do is apply these principles of working open, which means talking about our problems together in the open, allowing anyone to, to read along with that, to take place in that discussion, and then going from problems to discussing like what are the parts of those solutions that we can really share. Like where are our differences that big that we can't share a solution, and where are the differences not that big, and we could actually develop a piece of software, or a piece of policy, or a method for something together that we can also maintain that together and that we can learn to speak each other's language and solve larger and larger problems together. Uh, why I think that this is so important uh, and why it is so important for cities to learn how to collaborate with each other in an open way is also because it scales. It is the only way that we can work in which we can develop things together with others and also make sure that we can develop it together with anyone in the future that might need the same thing. And if the only way for us to collaborate is to sit in the same room, then we're never going to fix the problems of the world. Um, so by talking to each other, maybe we can. Um, uh, of course, I'd love to tell you all more about this. So uh, if there's any questions, please feel free to hit me up on the, any of these media, like telephone uh, or, uh, or email. Um, and uh, feel free to, to use me to bounce some ideas off. Uh, okay. I think that's enough. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for, for your time and being so precise with that. Fo following Boris, uh, we have uh, Liora Skechter, uh, GCIO uh, of the Tel Aviv uh, municipality uh, in Israel and she's dealing also daily and you will see she has another approach that I think uh, you have a lot of luck because this uh, breaking of silos that Boris was telling is, is not the case in Tel Aviv but please tell us about your experience Leora. Is better. Hi, and I'd like to take the several 
next minutes to tell you a little bit about Smart City Tel Aviv and open data, and how our residents experience it on a daily basis. Every day, 400,000 Tel Avivians wake up, and they are joined by another million visitors who together make this city what it is, a non-stop city. Today, our residents receive quality and personalized service from commercial companies, in the coffee shop, in the food chain. We, in the municipality, adopted that uh, approach, and we provide personalized service to every resident in the city. More than that, we invest in new, innovative, and even surprising services. Our way to implement that concept is through Smart City Tel Aviv. And today, for the first time, I'd like to give you an exclusive peek into Tel Aviv experience, both from the command and control perspective and from the average Tel Avivian family. So let's start. I want, you to, I want to introduce you the Romi family, Daniel, Galit, and their children, Yael, who is one year old, and Guy, which is six years old. Today is a normal Tuesday in the Romi family. Galit, who work just, works just a few minutes from home, goes to work each morning using one of the 2,000 city bicycles. In order for Galit to know exactly where to go, she opens the municipality app and sees that there is one last bike in the station five minutes away. And this layer, for instance, is also in our open data. But what Galit doesn't know is that our command and control room constantly monitors the bicycle status in the city. They already know about the shortage in bicycles, and they are currently sending a car to fill the station. This is just one of many types of sensors that update our command and control and are open in our open data on matters ranging from sewage and security to parking traffic and public hazard. Being a resident of Tel Aviv, Galit enjoys membership in our residence club, Digital. In the past five years, Digital has provided personalized service to more than 200,000 residents in the city. In Galit's case, Digital sent her a text message. It is time for Yael vaccination. The appointment is today in the morning. If you wish to change the appointment, just enter this link. Of course, once the appointment is made, it is removed from the municipal appointment database. But unlike Galit, who went to work, Daniel decided to take the day off. He and Guy decided to celebrate by going to the beach. On the way to the beach, Daniel already knows, with the help of his municipality app, which beach has available chairs and parasols. And upon arrival, Daniel lets Guy book their beach facilities. They get a special discount because they are members of digital and because it is important for us to help reduce the cost of living in the city. After picking up Yael from the nursery, returning home, Galit calls, I saw in digital that there was a free event, dancing with babies in the near community center, and they decide to go. Daniel puts Yael in the stroller, and he and the family heads out to the community center. On the way, 
Guy noticed an overflowing trash bin. Guy takes his, his dad's phone, opens the municipality app, and informs the municipality about the new hazard. While they continue on the way, the command and control center has received the new uh, report, and now they are sending a municipality worker to take care of the hazard. This is our command and control room. And once the hazard has been dealt, Daniel gets an online update. Just before Galit leaves work, she gets an SMS for digital, which invites her to a show with a big discount. Again, the municipality proactively offers relevant and free discount events to the digital members. Galit's called the babysitter, and after washing the kids and kissing them, they take a car from the city car sharing project, Autotel, heading to the concert. So, let's review what we have just seen. Our smart city solution rely upon two main principles. One, personalize proactive and innovative service to our residents. Our residents get information, free events, and advanced services according to their specific characterism, fit the residential area and hobbies. And second is managing the city in a smart way that gets indicators from the field, from the sensor, from the residents of the city. And all of this gives us accurate assessment of what is happening right now in the city and allowing us to respond quickly and efficiently. And looking at the data that we expose in the open data, we see a very low usage of the open data because just getting the information is not good enough. After meeting with a lot of startups in the city of Tel Aviv, and we have a lot of them, we understand that there has to be something else, more than just getting the data. We call it an open architecture, the ability of a startup to get information, even personal information, not general information, from the municipality is very important. And really activate actions inside the municipality database, web services, actions of reports, of payments. This is the uh, missing link to make open data really usage in our perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leora. It is a very human uh, way of translating the, the open data, so thank you very much for that kind of uh, presentation. Now we have, uh, uh, we can say the, 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 the person that is not really uh, connected to one uh, council, but to many council. It's the fireware uh, expert, uh, Mr. Stefano De Pamphilis, who is the COO of uh, the Fiber Association. Uh, he is going to talk, uh, talk us about how this, uh, we can say, a standard that is uh, being adopted by many implement implementers of the, the smart city uh, platforms and application uh, has relationship with the uh, open data. So please, Stefano. Thank you, Rodolfo. Thank you for your kind words. And uh, thank you for uh, the invitation of uh, this, this session, which is quite uh, interesting and relevant uh, for us. Um, and also, the, 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 this, the, the talk itself, the, 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 the title, Leveraging the Adoption of uh, Open Data Sets uh, in Order to Improve Urban Services. This is a quite interesting thing, and we saw a nice example just a moment ago. <clears throat> what I would like to talk is to show what uh, with Fireware we provide in this context, and some maybe provocative statements that I will learn, will make at the end just to create a bit of debate <laughs> to make uh, things. So um, something that Leora showed to us is very important. 
But it's very important by the way to understand where we are. Because in order to really take the decision, whatever, uh, whoever we are, whoever uh, human being, the first things that we do, we collect information ourselves. We look around us, we take with our five senses all the possible information, then we make the next step. This is what is extremely important. This is what we do normally. So if we do this normally ourselves, why the, 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 the software, the application we build cannot do this? And this is what is FIWER about. FIWER is about technologies that allow to understand the context and react about the context. Many of the things that uh, the family of Galit, the, she was, they were doing, is because they're reacting about the context somehow. But the context was injected in that. So, in order to take whatever decision we are doing, first of all, we look about the current situation. So, context matters. This is a key principle for every smart decision. Because if we take a decision, whatever we do as a, also a human being, without knowing what is around us, normally we take a wrong decision or a stupid decision, let's say. So context is the key element. Of course, together with context, what is also important, we understand the concept because we have an experience. So also we get information about the past. But this, the past is, so, is just a long series of contexts that are made somewhere, that create our experience. Uh, in, the con in the context of smart cities, to use the same word twice, what does it mean, this? Means defining the concept of interest. These are just some examples. It can be much more, of course. The, context of, uh, the concept of interest, in this case, there is a shop, there is a bus, there is a, um, uh, the citizen itself. In the example that uh, Liora showed before, it could have been the trash bin, it could have been the theater or the events in the cities, the, the status of the streets and, and the status of the beaches. No, these are the kind of uh, things that, oops, I'm moving too much. <laughs> That, that describe the context. And, uh, and uh, so this, first we have to model this. We have to define that. And when this is done, on top of this we can reason, we can understand things. And it is, is important that, and this is maybe an answer to the, uh, they call uh, in Tel Aviv open architecture, we call uh, this, uh, uh, data models because the building of the context, what is in the context is in fact a data model, it's a knowledge model, this concept and ID and uh, attributes they have, that allows to share information. And this is the key element because yes, it's important to have the, the data, but this data should be under understandable, should be modelized in a way that everybody can, can use them. So access, easy access to the information and understanding of what the information is. For instance, in this case, this, uh, this, con this uh, data model is a model for uh, uh, modeling uh, parking, uh, smart parking systems. This model has been used by different cities in Europe, but also outside Europe, the same model, and the same application knowing the the point of access is able to, to drive a, a person from, uh, well, in this case was in Porto, to find also a parking slot in, in Antwerp or in, or in Ancona, because they use and they expose the same information. This, uh, the context information modeling that is implemented through Orion Context Broker, that is the key component of the fiber, uh, the fiber technologies, <coughs> is built according to uh, a standard that is now the, uh, the became a, a, an Etsy standard with the name uh, 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 NGSI LD, sorry. And also, another information more importantly, as this approach, the context progress, this has also been taken by the European Commission in the initiative of uh, the Connecting European Facility which is an initiative of the European Commission where few, they call building blocks, few elements 
are endorsed and provided to public administrations to, in, in Europe in order to build applications that can go uh, uh, across the barriers, the boundaries of the various, the various countries. Um, but what about the data economy? This is an, uh, an element of discussion because, of course, you have this we have the context information, we provide the content, we provide information to everybody, but the data, they have a cost. If the data has a cost, shall they also have a value? And this is an important element of understanding how to go ahead because data should be sustained somehow. So just to conclude with some uh, statements that I would like to leave you and also to, to be in the discussion. So. <clears throat> First of all, in order to be, a scale, uh, to be uh, a smart city, what we think and we believe is that you need to have a scalable platform that easy, the access and the management of the heterogeneous context data. And these data are provided at the right time because if the information about the, the event arrives after the event is done, Garlit cannot go there. So information should be provided at the right time. Not necessarily real time, but at the right time, yes. And it's important to notice that the information that describe the context are not just digits, they're not just uh, numbers, they are heterogeneous. We may have data coming from sensors, we can have streams coming from cameras, we can have uh, uh, Twitter message from the people, we can have many things of, of, that describe the context, and all of this should be managed. They form, all of them form the context. The second element is that, uh, I think I'm late, but the open data models are built by experience, are the core of this understanding, are the core of this understanding. Because, yes, you can have open data sets, that is, that is great and this is important. But if you don't have an access of those that is uniform, that can be shared, you don't do anything. So open data models is the next level that we are envisaging. And because of that, uh, the Fire Foundation together with the TM Forum, we made an announcement uh, Monday. We created a, a joint initiative where cities are the actors and there are already 11 cities worldwide that are collaborating in building those data models in order that those data models can be shared and can be owned by those who have to create value out of them. And this is quite an important initiative that is open to everybody to, to join, to our, every city to join, and this makes the, the next step. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Stefano. So it's something important that the value of the, of the data versus the cost that it has for many organizations to, to, we'll see afterward what is the real use that we are making in, in your organization or that. Now I want to introduce uh, Mr. Mohamed Juhari from Casablanca. Uh, he's the general director of uh, Cas Events and Animation. And he's going to explain us how open data is using in his uh, council. So please, Mohammed. Thank you, Mr. Barero. Good afternoon. My name is Mohamed Jouari, and I am pleased to be here today to talk to you about the Digital Transformation Master Plan of Casablanca. Casablanca, comme vous le savez tous, c'est la ville la plus peuplée du Maroc, mais elle est surtout reconnue par son dynamisme économique. Et pour cause, Casablanca contribue à elle seule à 30% de son PIB, de, du PIB national. Sa modernité au niveau des infrastructures et des services fait que, son nombre, fait que de nombreux Marocains s'y installent. Cette pression démographique constante sur la ville pose de nombreux défis, que ce soit en termes d'environnement, en termes de mobilité ou de charges administratives ou encore en termes de ressources financières. Il est donc apparu fondamental pour les autorités de la ville de transformer et d'optimiser les différents services de la ville et le passage au numérique s'est imposé comme une solution pertinente. Et pour cause, d'ici 2020, 21 milliards d'objets connectés 
produiront des données et Casablanca est déterminée à être partie prenante de ces mutations. Aujourd'hui, Casablanca se rêve en ville future et elle fait plus qu'en rêver, puisqu'en effet, depuis 2015, la métropole s'est investie dans une nouvelle stratégie misant sur la transformation numérique de la gestion de la ville. Une stratégie qui est l'aboutissement d'une démarche engagée dans le cadre du programme de développement du Grand Casablanca 2020. Pour ce faire, Casablanca a adopté une, nou une nouvelle vision urbaine consistant à exploiter les différentes données de la métropole et cela avec une vision concrétisée par la mise en place de schémas directeurs de la transformation numérique de la ville. Ce schéma a pour objectif principal l'amélioration du climat des affaires et du cadre de la vie des habitants, mais également de renforcer les liens entre les acteurs locaux, publics et privés par la mutualisation et la création de synergies. D'ailleurs, dans ce, ce schéma directeur, déjà 70 projets majeurs ont été identifiés. L'objectif étant, bien entendu, de faciliter l'accès aux services et démarches administratives pour renforcer l'engagement citoyen et la participation inclusive. Ces orientations stratégiques ont guidé, ont guidé ce schéma et j'en citerai quelques-uns, notamment un système d'information en ligne avec la stratégie Smart City de la ville, un système d'information renforcé par une meilleure inclusion sociale et surtout un système d'information efficace et flexible, accessible pour les parties prenantes. En définitive, tout a été pensé et réfléchi avec comme point central, point nodal, le bien-être du citoyen. Parmi les chantiers phares de, euh, phares, pardon, de cette transformation figure les, le projet, bien sûr, Casablanca Smart City, qui comprend plusieurs actions visant, un, les services administratifs, la mobilité, les services urbains, l'environnement et les services d'intérêt général. Une cartographie, une cartographie applicative du système d'information de la métropole a été mise en place et cette dernière se décline en plusieurs domaines de compétences parmi les, lesquels on peut citer le pilotage pour offrir des outils numériques d'aide à la décision, le pôle métier pour faciliter la gestion des activités de la ville ou le pôle support pour une meilleure optimisation des moyens humains et logistiques. Et parce qu'on ne peut pas améliorer ce qu'on ne peut pas mesurer, le schéma directeur de Casablanca a abouti au lancement d'un portefeuille de projets centré sur le, la data à court et moyen terme. Et pour premier fruit, et parmi les premiers fruits de la réalisation de ce schéma directeur, nous pouvons parler de Casastore, qui est une plateforme dédiée à la présentation des applications web et mobiles de la ville, qui implique directement le citoyen en l'encourageant à, à s'engager dans les activités de la, de la plateforme, et ce dans le but de favoriser un écosystème de compétitivité positive entre les différentes applications. Des services d'intérêt général ont également été mis en place à travers des portails Internet et des applications mobiles telles que CasablancaCity.ma, le portail de la ville de Casablanca pour ceux qui voudraient visiter Casablanca, oui, Casablanca.com, un outil au service de l'attractivité de la ville de Casablanca qui contient toutes les informations nécessaires pour les résidents comme pour les touristes ou les investisseurs. Casabrec, une, applica une application géolocalisée qui indique aux utilisateurs les principaux lieux en fonction de là où ils se trouvent. L'organisation de Hackathon et de Créatan témoigne également de notre, de notre intention d'impliquer les citoyens dans la construction de la ville numérique. Les, les, les start-up casablancaises ou les casablancais d'une manière générale sont ainsi invités à mettre leur imagination au service du territoire en proposant des, proje des projets collaboratifs et inclusifs. Et pour y parvenir, ils ont eu accès aux données de la ville et à celles de ses différents délégataires. Et bien sûr, il est important de préciser à ce niveau-là que nous ne dématérialisons pas les procédures administratives pour le plaisir de les dématérialiser, mais bien au contraire pour améliorer le service rendu aux usagers et faciliter leur quotidien. Les, pr les plateformes digitales Casa Urba et Rojas ont permis de centraliser différents types de données et nous permettent aujourd'hui de mesurer objectivement plusieurs indicateurs clés. Casablanca s'est ainsi doté également d'une plateforme, Casa Urba Data, qui regroupe l'ensemble des données partageables 
entre les administrations d'une part et les citoyens d'autre part. La, la plateforme se veut avant tout un outil d'amélioration continue permettant non seulement de mesurer l'apport des, des plateformes digitales mises en place, mais également d'évaluer la pertinence et l'efficience des dispositifs réglementaires et des décisions organisationnelles adoptées. Pour conclure, permettez-moi de partager avec, avec vous notre conviction que l'aménagement numérique de Casablanca permettra à la ville d'améliorer son accessibilité et sa comp compétitivité et donc de renforcer son attractivité par la disponibilité d'une offre numérique à même d'améliorer le, le, le climat des affaires et de simplifier les procédures et conditions de vie de citoyens. Et pour ce faire, de, no de nombreux projets sont en cours de réalisation, comme par exemple des bornes tactiles interactives euh, dans des places publiques, l'équipement en bornes Wi-Fi gratuit dans des espaces publics, la mise en place d'un système d'information géolocalisé pour, entre autres, la gestion du patrimoine de la ville, le déploiement de capteurs pour la gestion du stationnement et du trafic routier, le déploiement de, de capteurs IoT, Internet des objets, pour la gestion de la propreté et la distribution de l'eau et d'électricité. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any question, please don't hesitate to ask me. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Mohamed, for your presentation. And now we are going to start a turn of a question by, by the audience. And I would like you, I don't know if uh, we have already some questions from, from you. There is a question for, for Boris uh, in the audience and say, how would you define the open data system of the city of Amsterdam? What are its main advantages and inconvenience? All right. Um, so, If I understand this uh, correctly, like what are the advantages and disadvantages of an open data system for the city of Amsterdam? Um, I think a lot of the change about open data came about with this notion of the, of the data economy, um, and that has, has been a large political driver. Um, however, now that we have an open data system, the big advantage that we see there is that because we now have our data in order, we have uh, uh, data available from one municipal organization to the other municipal organization, that actually most of the use of the open data is within the organization. Um, we have an open data portal, and this open data portal has about 5,000 visitors every day, and 4,000 of those are from within the governmental organization. Mm -hmm. So inside the government, And uh, what we really found out is that the biggest advantage until now and why open data is really paying for itself is because we're just so much better able to provide uh, the, the basic public service delivery that, that is expected from us. We also see that there is community groups that are using our data to look at what we're doing, there's uh, uh, apps that are using our data inside of their, their, their systems, um, there is uh, different other, other governments that have found our data and are connecting to our systems without us even like in connecting with them and without having to go through official channels for that. But for us, the, the biggest advantage is that we find out now suddenly our organization works with itself way better in a ways that we could have never uh, expected. And I think that is because it is not about, it used to be that if you needed someone's data, you needed to like call them and make like an appointment and go to their office and talk about like, well, how do you need this and how often and what does that mean? And it, isn't no, it is no longer like that. You can just use another department's data. And any inconvenient that you oh. may find? Because Sorry. the, the yeah, question yeah, yeah. is not yeah, only yeah. about no, advantages, I think, but I think also inconvenience. Well, a uh, very big inconvenience is also exactly this. You need to have your data in order. Um, one of the things that we really learned with, with going through this open data process is that now we know how much data there is in there or how outdated a lot of the data is. And we have to be open about this. Uh, we found out that, for instance, we had uh, three different authoritative sources of um, where street furniture and street signs were in the city. 
because three departments had their own like the official version of that okay. of that database and suddenly you find the need of like oh if we want to open this up we also we need to consolidate this uh, which changes a lot also in the political makeup of your of your of your civil servantry organization mm -hmm. and so it, it, it creates a lot of conflict in that in okay. that sense I want to extend the, the, the question also to the rest of you so first of all it's very interesting um, because in Tel Aviv the situation is different um, the municipality workers that not really use open data. If they need the data, they, they have it. I think our situation may be slightly different because we own, we have 180 and we own all the data. So there's no uh, one sub-organization that owns part of it and, and so on. So in order to expose it, it's very easy for us. In order to use it on daily basis for the municipality, they get it. They get the data. They use the system, not the open data tool, in order to do it. We aim the op open data for the startup community, which is very developed in, in uh, Tel Aviv. We want to make it a tool that they develop software upon it for the residents of the city. But what we have discovered in the past two years, that it's not enough. It's really not enough. It's the, the data is not attractive for a developing application. The online data is more attractive. Maybe in transportation, it's a little bit attractive. But other subjects, not really. So, and, and we have several mechanisms to meet startups. And we have met maybe 150 startups in, in the last year. And we understand that what they want is different. We wa they want to ask about a specific private set of data. Let's say that I want to develop a, a payment app. So I have to know how much you personally owe the municipality. And the second thing is I want to really pay from the app, really pay the municipality. So I need to get personal data, and I really need to activate web service inside the municipality. So, so that's the next sta stage for us. We are talking about or ar open architecture that will allow it, allow it with, of course, the uh, approval of the residents. Thank you. You want to put your opinion on that? Convenient, convenient of the more inconvenient, no? Because uh, we have seen so many benefits about using open data, but uh, really what the, the drawback that, that we have for that. Well, well, um, so first about the, um, yes, adoption of open source. Well, first of all, let's say that uh, all the, the fiber technology, they are open source. Uh, they um, uh, are technologies that allows the, uh, any way, uh, because they are all technology, they are offered through open uh, APIs, open standards. They allow any way to build application on top of them that are uh, business application closed software. So this is a benefit for those who want to implement these things. Because uh, the, 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 the standards, the, the, the license that we use for our software is a software that if you use the APIs through the, the, your, your software used APIs, uh, our APIs, this does not constitute derivative work. And this creates a lot of uh, potential. But the other potential is because of the notion of the, 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 as I said before, the context broker. Because if you have the possibility to open, to share the data in a way that, uh, in a controlled way anyway, because uh, uh, opening the data doesn't mean that the, the data are there are allowed for free or in any case, or everybody can see all the data. So that's no, because we have a security mechanism that allows to intercept uh, who is accessed and what is accessed. Well, that's normal, uh, I mean. But this allows uh, the, the building of uh, application and this uh, stimulate uh, things. In fact, if you go to in, our, in our stand, you see that, yes, uh, the, 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 the boot of fiber, you see that around us this time we brought more than 40 SMEs all implementing solutions based on fiber because they are happy to use this technology they provide the products to municipalities. Uh, uh, actually, there are more than 100 municipalities worldwide that are using the technology. Exactly because of this, because uh, your concern is correct. So, the data per se, uh, the open data, they are not. First of all, people likes, 
uh, real-time data, right? Data that are what describe what is going on, and this is why the context, but also the people that would like to access this in a way that doesn't see, the, yes, not to go to one department or to another department, to another department to take the data because they have access to all that, to all of them through the context program. Okay, and Mohamed, <coughs> thank you. Hello. Pour Casablanca, et comme je l'ai présenté, aujourd'hui le schéma directeur donc, est en phase de, de mise en place, de mise en œuvre. Donc aujourd'hui, euh, nous on a testé justement, alors je ne sais pas si on pourra parler de open source ou open data, en tout cas au niveau des expériences avec le citoyen et notamment avec les start-up, on a utilisé le système de open data, c'est-à-dire que nous avons mis à la disposition de ces start-up justement innovantes des données pour permettre d'avoir des solutions des innovatives qui, qui va aider et améliorer la qualité de vie du citoyen au quotidien, de, notamment au niveau de transport, de la propreté, le ramassage des ordures, etc. Des choses qui touchent directement les citoyens dans son, son quotidien. Donc, mais mais c'est pour ça que je dis, je ne sais pas si on est vraiment dans l'open data, oui. ou, mais effectivement, c'était une ouverture, on va dire, euh, contrôlée, maîtrisée, puisque c'est la ville et ses délégataires qui ont mis à la disposition pendant une durée ces données-là auprès de ces start-up pour justement les utiliser. Mais après, euh, ça, ça devrait être réglementé et justement, toute la mise en place de ce schéma devrait être accompagnée par un certain nombre de règles d'utilisation de ces données, de ces data, pour pouvoir les exploiter, que ce soit au quotidien par le citoyen, que ce soit au niveau de transport, le trafic routier avec les, les, la régulation de... de de, de, de la route ou bien au niveau de, des start-up pour une utilisation, on va dire, une, et, et d'innovation et de propositions de solutions. Voilà. Okay. Et, et, we have another question uh, from the audience and it's related to privacy of the data. This is a big thing everywhere. Who owns the data? How it can be used? Or what are the, the, the main concerns that you have about the privacy of the of the data if it is open for so, um, so in in the city of Amsterdam there's about 50 developers and designers that are building open data solutions and also internal data solutions um, they work in teams and every one of those teams has a privacy lawyer on it because with every data set that you touch and everything that you open you need to understand what the implications can be to people's lives of opening that up. And it's not just about that single, single data set or a single data point, but it's also really about like if you get data from people, like how could you layer that? And if you layer two data sets with each other or three or four, what privacy could that expose? Um, and actually that's a really important part of that. Uh, in Amsterdam, the, the city is very dedicated to working in an open and less way, but also that means taking your time and, and really thinking about like, what does privacy mean for, for opening up this particular set of, set of data? And then I want to say that like, um, there is open data and there is open process. Yes. And that your data might not be open, the fact that you might not be able to share a specific data point for privacy reasons does not mean that the system also needs to be invisible. And so you can close the data, but you can still show people what you're doing to their data or with their data. And I think that's also really crucial. You want to add anything because we sorry. ran out mm -hmm. ran out of time, so sorry about that. But if you want to something very brief about this, but very brief, please. Yeah, I, I agree. On, on open data, it's slightly more easy because you, you take out all the private data, of course. Uh, you work with lawyers li like you do. And if it, there is a problem or might be a problem, then you aggregate the data a little bit and, and that's, uh, that's okay. That's eliminated threat. That when, we, when you try to implement open architecture, it's, it's, it's very difficult because then it's about private data. And then we are working about a contract between the startups and us, a mechanism that will try to shut up the connection if, if uh, needed. And you really need to think about the cyber uh, threat because you're letting 
uh, web services and data from other organization, organization that you do not really know, to get into the municipality, and that's, I think, the, the biggest challenge. Very statement. Brief. Very brief statement. <laughs> Privacy is, the, is at the core of the data economy. That is uh, the issue at the end of the day. If you don't have this, you don't have also the value evaluation of the data, that's okay. because they have no value. Thank you, Stefan. A, a, a sentence in French that you may <laughs> <laughs> do about open data. I just want to renew my thanks to FIRA for this occasion to de présenter l'état d'avancement, je dirais, de ce schéma directeur. Aujourd'hui, ce que j'ai envie de dire, c'est que tout simplement, c'est un schéma directeur de transformation qui a été fait par des Marocains, des Casablancais pour des Casablancais, c'est très important. Et ça a été fait avec toujours le, le citoyen qui est au, au cœur, qui est au centre de la réflexion, c'est-à-dire par rapport à tout ce qui a été proposé, c'est toujours avec l'utilisation qui en sera faite par le, le citoyen. Donc pour nous, le citoyen, c'est vraiment le, le, le point central de toute la réflexion, peu importe derrière la technologie qui est utilisée ou bien le, 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 le langage, j'ai envie de dire, qui a été utilisé. Voilà. OK. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we've run out of time. I'm so sorry. I have uh, around 10 more questions here, but we only <laughs> covered two of them. It's a, it's a, it's a pity. Nevertheless, I, I want to wrap a uh, little the, this. We, we have these experiences about the three cities by Amsterdam, Tel Aviv, and Casablanca, and we have this es explanation about the standards, the, the value of the data versus the, the cost of the data, how the benefits uh, in, in Leora was t telling us the residents and how the residents benefits about the open data that this position from you is more related with the government and the management of the data in, internally in the, in, the city, in the city council. And well, something that has been very interesting from Mohammed is the, the measurements, the, how they are uh, dealing with that in their, in, their, in their 70 projects they have in the uh, steering plan that is uh, something interesting that may have another opportunity. So I, I want to give an applause to these uh, magnificent uh, speakers. Um, I give the, the word to Samia that is going to wrap around the whole track that you have done in the previous panel, plus the panel that we are finishing just now. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Adolfo. And thank you for the panel. It was terrific. Um, we're going to wrap soon. We started by asking, where do we want to be in 2038? I think we're getting there. We started with Africa, Brazil, and now all the countries. Three main challenges, the architecture issues that you all brought up, how to do it in a smart way, the data so that it's accurate, it's reliable, and it's reusable across different technology cycle, and finally, the people. You cannot have smart cities without smart people whether they're the technologists, the policy makers, or the users, citizens. How do we all build our collective knowledge so that smart cities really become places where people have healthy, happy, secure lives? So I want to close this panel and thank the audience who stayed so long with us. Thank you so much for your question and for your presence. Thank you very much for the expert, the panelists, the moderators. And thanks for the host, Barcelona and Smart City Expo World Congress for having us. Thank you all.